Hey Optimancers, Chris here. My last video discussed scrappling, dragging, and shoving, and the reason why we would want to use these options to employ teamwork tactics with the spellcasters in our party. Now, if you want to make a grappling build, it's not hard. Barbarians are pretty much built in as good grapplers, and if you go Rude Knight Fighter, it's built in as well. Plus, you get the size boost. Monks, though. Well, once again, things get more challenging. However, it can be done. So, today, for you monk fans out there, I'm going to show you how you can make a monk that can grapple. Now, why would we want a monk grappler anyways? Well, there's two things that work nicely for us. The first is movement speed. Once you start dragging, your movement is halved, so we want more movement for more dragging. And the second, it's kind of simple. Two hands are available. We can grapple an enemy, then we can grapple another enemy, then we can drag two enemies instead of one. Someone with a shield just can't do that. And someone that relies on a weapon for damage has to sheath or drop it, but we can kick at those grappled enemies no problem. So twice as much grappling with larger drag distances and we can still hit them. That's why Monk. Now, sometimes I like to give a little peek behind the scenes at coming up with builds and the bumps in the road, if you will. And yeah, so this build had such a bump. So the build was done. The script was done. And I don't think the build I came up with should be that much of a surprise. Way of the Astral Self Monk, I think that's pretty obvious. I mean, they get that feature at level 3 where they're making a strength check, but then they can substitute a wisdom check instead. But I wanted advantage on that athletics check, so how do I get advantage? Then I noticed the shifter. I was recently asked a question about the shifter, so I took a look and it just kind of stuck out to me that Wild Hunt Form gives shifter advantage on wisdom checks. So there it was. Shifter, way of the astral self, bit of multi-classing, and away we go. Punched the numbers, figured it was good enough to present. Then I'm scripting, and I'm grabbing the screenshots of the various features, and I take a closer look at Arms of the Astral Self. You can use your Wisdom modifier in place of your Strength modifier when making Strength checks and Strength saving throws. Wait, that's worded a bit differently than I remembered. It doesn't say you make a Wisdom check instead, it says you use your Wisdom modifier on the Strength check. So is it still a strength check even though you're using your wisdom modifier? I wasn't 100% sure, so I figured I'd ask some rules wonks I know for their take. So I pinged Think DM and D4 Deep Dive and Destructo Boy. I said, pinging some rules wonks here, but anyone who sees this, feel free to chime in. So I'm an astral self monk making a strength check. I use this feature. And I put that up. Is it still a strength check or is it changed to a wisdom check? Indestructible Boy says Wisdom Modifier replaces the Strength Modifier, but that does not override that a Strength Check is being made. D4 Deep Dive, my take exactly. Think DM, I fifth this. Yeah, basically unanimous, everyone agrees. This is a Strength Check, even though you're using your Wisdom Modifier. Shifter does not work. It doesn't do anything for us here. The build just had to change. And then the math, and then the script. And here we are. As usual, when I'm talking about a build that can do damage as well as contribute in other ways, I'll be using my baseline damage calculations to determine if our damage is worth the effort. With these kinds of builds, just meeting baseline, I think, is enough for a viable build. Now, I should also point out that if we do a grapple, we're not doing an attack. So it's either we do the damage or we do the grapple. Though there is always the grapple, then shove prone, and then attack with advantage. So they can work in harmony. So I mentioned Way of the Astral Self as a subclass. As a straight monk, I'm not a fan of this subclass, but for our grapple build, it's just the subclass that works. That third level feature, Arms of the Astral Self, allow us to use our Wisdom modifier in place of our Strength modifier when making Strength checks and Strength saving throws. When we grapple, it's a Strength Athletics check, and Strength is hard to get on a Monk build. Wisdom, dead easy. So this is just the choice. Now, if you disagree with me and the people who said this is still a Strength check, well, like I said, this was initially a Shifter build. It's an easy switch, just do Shifter. However, I'm now convinced it is still a strength check, so I want advantage on strength checks. There are lots of ways to get that. 
Rage is easy at level 1 on some builds, but not on a Monk build. Monk and Barbarian would be a fun mix, but the multi-class requirements are really hard and leave you with a constitution score that you just don't want on a melee character. Giants might, however. That one fits like a glove. Bonus action setup, multiple combats per day, size increase, and advantage on strength checks. And there's a small damage boost as well. But let's talk about race, because I kept changing my mind once it was clear I wasn't going with Shifter. Durgar, I mean, in large reduce, I think is really good for a grapple build. I think if this build had some second level spell slots, so I could cast it more than once, that's probably the way I would have gone. Tabaxi is really strong here. You can double your movement speed, which doubles your dragging distance. One turn of not moving, and you get the feature back. Flying races have obvious advantages, but... I tend to avoid them in builds because I know a lot of DMs don't allow them, including me, by the way. Loxodon, that's another possibility. With two hands in a trunk, we could potentially grapple three things at once. Though, I try to avoid setting specific material, and Loxodon was not reprinted in Monsters of the Multiverse, so it's still a Ravnica race. However, not being able to get advantage on grapple checks through Shifter Wisdom Advantage really kind of messed up my build. I was going to get both Arms of the Astral Self and Giant's Might, which work great together, but no matter how I did the build, I couldn't get extra attack at level 5, then Wisdom-based grapples with advantage until level 8. Now, I figured that if we're using Wisdom, we still have a decent grapple chance without advantage, but I figure a real grapple build needs to be able to grapple a bit better than that. And no race provides advantage on strength checks, except potentially Duergar with Enlarge Reduce, but... Like I said, that's only once per day, and it's an action to set up, and it uses concentration. So this took me to the Kenku. So Kenku were one of the weakest races in the game, but they got improvements in Monsters of the Multiverse, and now the improvements actually work for us here. We choose medium or small size. Since we're a grappler, we want medium. Speed, 30 feet. Expert duplication allows us to produce exact duplicates of writing or craft work. A ribbon feature, but some nice utility possibilities. Now, Kenku Recall. This is the feature we want. We get two skill proficiencies, I would say perception and, hey, athletics. And we give ourselves advantage on a skill check, like a grapple attempt. Now, this is limited use, the standard proficiency bonus per long rest. But this kind of bridges the gap for us. I mean, once we get Giant's Might, we may not even be able to use that every fight. So, this can fill in those gaps as well. But on those important grapple checks, like we attempt a grapple and we discover the enemy has a big bonus on acrobatics or athletics, well, then we can attempt to grapple again and we can throw on advantage. And finally, mimicry. Kenku can now actually speak, but they can also mimic sounds they've heard. This is actually fun for roleplay with some nice utility value, like kind of an audible illusion might. Now let's look at ability scores. We use our racial bonuses to provide a plus one to dexterity, constitution, and wisdom, and then we'll set them all to a starting score of 16. Since we're going the way of the astral self, from this moment on, raising our wisdom is the priority, since we'll be using wisdom for grapples. And also, for our attack and damage rolls, like unarmed strikes, and finally for DC of things like stunning strike. We take our first five levels in Monk. Now, Monks are not a great class, but the first five levels of them are fine. My problems with Monk tend to become apparent more at later levels. So, hit points, D8 per level. Wish it was D10, but it's not. It's D8. For proficiencies, I'll grab Stealth and Insight. And then Unarmored Defense, beginning at first level, when you're wearing no armor and not wearing a shield. Your armor class equals 10, plus your Dexterity modifier, plus your Wisdom modifier. This gives us a 16 armor class to start, which is okay. Martial Arts, the big thing here is at level 1, we get a bonus action attack. So we'll be doing that. We'll pick up a quarterstaff, kind of for our main attack, use the versatile property. That gives us D8 plus 3 damage, or 7.5 on average. Assuming 60% average chance to hit, with a 5% chance of critical, the quarterstaff is giving us 4.7 DPR. Then the unarmed strike, D4 plus 3 damage, is 5.5 average. With the same assumptions, that's 2.8 damage. So that gives us a total DPR of 7.5 at level 1. And the baseline at level 1 is 5.7. So we're comfortably above. At level 2, we get key points. And we can spend a key point to use Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, or Step of the Wind. 
These options either give us an extra unarmed strike with our bonus action, dodge as a bonus action, or disengage or dash with our bonus action. Once we start grappling creatures and we're dragging them if we want some extra distance, we might actually use Step of the Wind with this character. We get a number of key points equal to our monk level, and they recover on a short rest. At level 2, we have nothing to spend them on except these three options. The baseline I use for damage is going up, but if we spend these points on flurry blows, we can at least still squeeze over the baseline. Our walking speed also increases by 10 feet, so we're up to 40 feet. The higher our movement speed gets, the more dragging potential we have, though we aren't much of a grappler until we hit level 3. Key Fueled Attack allows us, if we use a key point as part of our action on our turn, to make one attack with an unarmed strike or monk weapon as a bonus action before the end of our turn. When we get this, we literally have no way to use it, because all the ways to spend key on our turn are bonus actions. But once we get Stunning Strike and Focused Aim, then we can make some use of this. But it's really not a big deal, because eventually we're going to just be doing unarmed strikes with our bonus action anyways. So Key Fueled Attack works well on some monks, not on this one. Deflect Missiles comes in at level 3. I would generally advise against spending key to throw the ammunition back, but using a reaction to reduce the damage of a ranged attack, that's probably a good use of our reaction. Then we choose our Monistic Tradition, and we'll choose Way of the Astral Self. This gives us the Arms of the Astral Self feature. This costs a key to set up and uses a bonus action, but it has a 10 minute duration, so ideally we can have this set up already when initiative is rolled. If we do have to set this up in combat though, what we want to do is get close to a couple enemies, maybe enemies we plan to grapple, and then they make dexterity saving throws or they take force damage equal to two rolls of our martial arts die. At this level, that's not very much. So our benefits include using wisdom modifier for strength checks and saving throws. Obviously our main advantage here is for grappling. This becomes the first level where this character is decent at grappling. We're currently at a plus five, which means we can probably grapple a challenge rating appropriate creature of our level most of the time. But if we use Kenku Recall, then our grappling should be fairly reliable. I went over in the last video, talking about grappling an ogre, how a plus five will probably succeed against the ogre, but you throw advantage on it, suddenly you got 80% chance. Next, we can use our astral arms to make unarmed strikes. Our reach with our astral arms is going to be 10 feet, and the damage type is force, so it's a reliable damage type, though any monk gets reliable damage on unarmed strikes in a few levels anyways. But our unarmed strikes with our astral arms allows us to use wisdom in place of strength or dexterity for attack and damage rolls. So this kind of incentivizes us to concentrate on wisdom over dexterity. Fourth level, we get quickened healing, and it's not very good. We'll increase our wisdom at level 4. This increases our armor class from 16 to 17, increases our chance to hit with unarmed strikes with our astral arms from plus 5 to plus 6, as well as our bonus damage from plus 3 to plus 4, and it increases our grapple bonus from plus 5 to plus 6. The DC of all our monk features also increases from 13 to 14. So, yeah, this is kind of an obvious way to spend our ability score increases until we get to Wisdom 20. Level 4, we get Slow Fall. This allows us to use our reaction to reduce the damage of falling damage we take by 5 times our monk level. So at this point, I'm kind of imagining grappling a creature, then we drag it off the side of a bridge or a building, then we let it drop for full damage, and it falls prone while we slowly land beside it. Now, I think there is a question. Can we maintain our grapple while falling with a grappled creature? The rules don't really specify. Maybe if we use slow fall, we drop at a slower rate, and therefore the grapple creature leaves our reach during the fall. Maybe we slow both our falls, so we'll want to release the grapple creature so the target takes full damage. Or maybe we take reduced damage and the grapple creature takes full damage. That would be ideal. Uh, I'm not sure it makes sense, but your DM is going to make the ruling, not me. At level 5, we get focused aim, which allows us to use key points to turn misses into hits, the more key we spend, the more likely that miss is turned into a hit. Where this works out well is when we know we missed by one or two. Then we use one key point to get a hit, and that is definitely worth it. We also get extra attack at level 5. This is really important for grappling builds, because now our grapple is only using part of our attack action, leaving the other open for another grapple attempt, or just an attack. Like I said, often we might want to grapple two creatures. Now we can do it with a single action. And we get the famous, or maybe infamous, stunning strike. Spend one key, 
the opponent makes a constitution saving throw, and if they fail the saving throw, they're stunned until the end of our next turn. Stunned is really devastating. The creature is incapacitated, which means it can't take actions. It automatically fails strength and dexterity saving throws, and attacks against it have advantage. Something else about being incapacitated? Grapple checks against an incapacitated creature automatically succeed. Final thing is at level 5, our martial arts die scales to a d6. So how is our damage at level 5? Well, we raised our wisdom, not our dexterity. That means our unarmed strikes with astral arms actually do more damage on average than weapon attacks. So we won't use weapons anymore. This actually gives us another advantage. Our hands are now both empty, so we can grapple a creature. And we still have a hand free, so we can grapple another creature. And we can still make unarmed strikes on top of that. Unfortunately, there are no mechanics for grappling with our astral arms on top of that. I mean, feel free to ask your DM, but it is not specifically supported in the rules. But grappling two creatures means twice the benefit of grappling. That's two creatures we can drag into and out of our allies' effects, and our ability to make melee attacks is unhindered. And with our enhanced movement, that's more creatures grappled and greater movement with those grapples. This is one of the only monks where I could see, in some situations, actually making use of Step of the Wind for a dash action as a bonus action. If we're able to, say, grapple two creatures with our attack action, then maybe drag them across a spike growth, for example. At half movement, that would be 20 feet of dragging, or a total of 8d4 damage, 20 damage average. Then one key for 20 more damage. The party druid will love you. Our unarmed strikes now do d6 plus 4, a 7.5 average, and that's 4.7 average damage after we take into account chance to hit and all that. Two attacks through extra attack and another bonus action attack means 14.1 DPR. Then let's say we use three of our five key on flurry of blows and the other two to turn misses into hits. That'd bring us up to 15.9. Baseline at level five, 16.5. So we have fallen below baseline, even if we use all our key trying to improve our damage. And we're not a lot below, but we are below. We need to get that damage up. Fortunately, the baseline doesn't go up again until level 8, and we can get our damage above baseline with one more level. At level 6, we'll go into Fighter. We're medium size, which means we can grapple large sized creatures. We'll want Giant Smite to grapple huge sized creatures. Now, this multi class causes us to dip under the baseline damage eventually at level 11. If we went straight Monk, we could keep above the baseline at that point, but Giant Smite, I think, is something we just really want. We're into levels where huge creatures are going to be a thing. We want to be able to grapple them. We get a fighting style, and this decision is not as clear-cut as you might think. So, the defensive combat style. This gives a plus one to armor class, which would be great, but it only works if you're wearing armor, and we're not. Dueling would be great if it worked for unarmed strikes, but it requires a weapon, and we're not using a weapon. And that leaves us with unarmed fighting. Our martial arts die is already a d6, and this gives us a d8 instead. Which, once we get to 11th level in Monk, we're going to have it anyways. And we can do a bit of damage to a grapple creature, which sounds okay because we are a grappler, but it's a d4, so it's not a lot of damage. But our damage needs a boost. This gives us a bit of a boost when we need it. With the d8's damage instead of the d6's, our dpr inches up to 17.9, with a baseline of 16.5, so we're back over the baseline. We slip slightly at level 5, but we recover at level 6. At level 7, we take our second level of fighter to get the player favorite, Action Surge. Another action on our turn can do all kinds of things for us, but let's just assume we make two more unarmed strikes. That alone would bring our DPR up to 19.2, with a baseline of 17.7 .7 at levels 8 through 10. That means our DPR is above baseline right to level 11. The martial archetype we use is Rune Knight for Giant Smite. Giant Smite uses our bonus action, which with my initial shifter build created a bonus action conflict actually, that now we don't have, so that's good. And it means we can use this right on round one. This gives us advantage on all our grapple checks, so Kenku Recall now can be for when you run out of Giant Smite uses, or maybe you're saving them, or maybe just on some different skill checks. And Giant Smite will give us a small damage boost d6 on a single hit. However, remember that we're probably giving up a bonus action attack to set this up in the first place. So over a four round fight, this is probably only increasing our damage by about 1.3 per round average. 
but we'll take what we can get. Rune Knight also gives us Rune Carver, which is a fantastic feature. Cloud Rune is an automatic pick. What a great reaction. You take an attack that hit you or an ally within 30 feet and have that attack hit another creature of your choice other than the attacker within 30 feet. Use this for critical hits. This is usable once per short rest. Now I've had this come up a couple times. I've been playing a Rune Knight and I see somebody get hit with a critical hit or I get hit with a critical hit and I want to put it onto an enemy, but maybe only the enemy that hit me is within range. So what do you do then? Well, this is when you kill the wizard's familiar. That familiar with one hit point now just took like 60 points of damage. I have found the wizard always forgives me for using my cloud rune that way. For our second rune, either stone or fire are good choices. I've taken fire. It will improve our damage somewhat and gives us an option that can restrain enemies. This is going to have one lower DC than our monk features because it's based on constitution rather than wisdom, but we do have a good constitution score. Now we're going to go back to monk. We know our DPR is high enough until level 11, and then at level 11 we're going to struggle a bit, but once we get to 11 levels of monk, we recover. But first, let's look at monk 8 fighter 3. At 6 level, unarmed strikes count as magical, but we're doing force damage anyway, so this is likely unnecessary, except in the unlikely case we're fighting something with force resistance or immunity, in which case we could attack with our regular unarmed strikes instead. At 6 level, we get visage of the astral self. This one's not very good. Unless your party does darkness plus ability to see in magical darkness shenanigans. I mean, if the range of your dark vision is an issue, then maybe this is okay. Or if you're making a lot of insight checks, but you know, it's not great. Let's move on. Evasion is good. Our dexterity saves are good. So when we're hit by an effect that allows a dexterity save to take half damage, we'll either take half damage if we fail or likely no damage because we're likely to succeed. Stillness of mind. This allows us to use an action to end the charmed or frightened condition. Uh, and I've talked a lot about this feature in the past. I won't bother doing it again. Ability score increase at level 8 gets our wisdom up to 20. I should mention the 6th level of monk got our movement speed up to 45. And then our 10th level of monk is going to get it up to 50. But also, at 9th level of monk, we gain the ability to move along vertical surfaces and across liquids on a turn without falling during our move. This means we can drag creatures up walls or across liquids as well, and with multiple grappled creatures. So we grapple two huge creatures, then we scramble across a pit of acid, drop them in, scramble back, something like that. Purity of body at level 10 gives us immunity to disease and poison, and at 11th level in monk, this is 14th level overall, we get body of the astral self. This requires no additional key, thank goodness gives us a reaction to reduce elemental damage, and doubles the martial arts die on our unarmed strikes. Now, technically, this doesn't double our unarmed fighting style die, but fortunately, our martial arts die just matched that D8 anyways, meaning the unarmed combat style is now just a D4 damage to a grappled enemy. Now, I'm going to talk about the 14th level DPR, but let's first talk about what happened at level 11. Our base damage with attacks at that point was D8 plus 5, or 9.5 average, assuming 60% chance to hit, and a 5% crit chance, that's 5.9 average damage per attack. Our regular attack routine gave us 17.7, Action Surge gets us to 19.7, Fire Rune gets us to 20.6. We also have more key points, so let's say 2 key focused aim, turning misses into hits, that's 21.8, then Flurry of Blows, now we're at 24 DPR. 1.3 from Giant Smite, that's 25.3. And the baseline at level 11 is 26.44. I Again, we're close, but it has slipped a bit below. Now the baseline doesn't increase again until level 17. And we catch up at level 14. So remember, baseline is 26.44. Our base damage with an attack is now 2d8 plus 5, or 14 average. Assuming 60% chance to hit and a 5% crit chance, that's 8.6 average damage per attack. Our regular attack routine gets us to 25.8. Fire Rune alone gets us over baseline. Giant's Might gets us a bit more yet, leaving all our key, except for the one we used to set up the Astral Arms, and our Action Surge, all available for other things. So, stun, 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 I guess, or maybe dash, dash, dash. If we really want to focus on damage, though, we can get to 34.4 DPR. That's 30% over baseline. If the only other thing we're doing is grappling and dragging, that is not bad. 
So, I need to present a correction here, because I read the ability wrong, Empowered Arms does not double your damage dice for your martial arts die. It allows you to add an extra martial arts die once on your turn. Now, since you're likely to get one hit, that means that in terms of DPR, Empowered Arms probably adds a little over four to your total. So, when we look at my level 11 numbers, where we were sitting around 25, and then the baseline was around 26, Empowered Arms still gets us over baseline, but not nearly with the level of comfort in which I just presented. Expect your DPR to be sitting around 29. And it's one point shy of DPR baseline from level 17 through 20. So we do need to find one point higher by level 17 if we want to stay over baseline. Well, we'll go back to fighter for a level. Now our fourth level of fighter we get an ability score increase, and I actually considered taking the Savage Attacker feat. I normally don't take that feat. Then again, I normally don't have a base damage of 2d8 either. However, Savage Attacker only works with weapons, so it doesn't work for us. So instead, we're going to grab Skill Expert, and this is going to give us expertise on our athletics checks. I would have loved this to actually been on the build earlier, but this is the earliest I could fit it. But once we have a 20 Wisdom and Expertise and Advantage, I'd expect to succeed on pretty much all our grapple checks. This allows us to switch out what 11 levels of Monk made pretty pointless, the unarmed fighting style, and we'll switch it to Precision Attack. Now, why not Grappling Strike? Well, because, like I said in my previous build, there comes a point when you are a good grappler. You don't need an additional D8 bonus, and it's not worth making build decisions in order to get it. You don't need it. So instead, we'll take Precision Strike, and that's going to get our DPR up to baseline at level 17. Now at 12th level in Monk, we get an ability score improvement. And I must say, I would have loved to have put a plus one dexterity half feet here. But boy, went through the list and nothing fits here. So yeah, we're going to leave that dexterity score odd. If you wanted to, you could increase your dexterity here. But I figure we'll take the tough feet instead. Our hit points are Monk hit points. They're not great. And at this level, Tough is adding 32 additional hit points. Then we're getting Tongue of the Sun and Moon. This is basically like the Tongue spell permanently. Now the reason we want 14 levels of Monk is for Diamond Soul. This gives us proficiency in all saving throws. And if we make a saving throw and fail, we can spend a key point and re-roll it. Finally, our movement speed increases for the last time, taking us to a total of 55. As always, a link to this character sheet is in the video description. But let's do a breakdown. So first off, we could have gotten higher damage on a grapple build. Consider going Loxodon if you want to do that, and then use your trunk to grapple, and then you can use a two-handed weapon to bring down damage to a creature you grappled and shoved prone. Here though, we have a much enhanced movement speed and the ability to grapple two creatures and still have that monk bonus speed for grappling, all while still being able to attack creatures grappled with our main attack. We have the monk tricks, and we eventually get that big diamond soul feature. So how does our DPR end up? Well, we slipped under baseline just slightly at level 5, then we pulled back up at level 6. So we had that one little dip just under baseline. Then we're okay until level 11, and then we slip under again, and we pull back up to baseline at level 14, though we never slip far under or get much over after that. Now, I've done the math on a straight Astral Self Monk, and you can achieve baseline at all levels, but you won't be nearly as good at grappling, which was the focus here. The character sheet is showing here an athletics of plus 11, but remember, we will be substituting that minus 1 from strength to a plus 5 in wisdom, so actually our athletics ends up at plus 17, and we'll be making that with advantage. This means that unless a creature is immune to grapple, we should be able to grapple it. If it's gargantuan, though, we're going to need some help with an enlarge reduce spell. But anything huge and lower, we should be able to grapple, no problem. And I think if grappling and dragging is something you want to focus on, this build does have some advantages over more obvious routes. And it has some disadvantages. Overall, I think this build is viable at an optimized table. This is definitely a character you need to coordinate with your other players to make sure you have some good options for dragging enemies through. Because if you are just relying on damage here, the damage is not enough. But over these 18 levels, we're either over baseline or just barely under baseline. If we average it out, we're a little bit over baseline. And I've always said that if you can achieve baseline but you can't achieve 50% over, 
then you need to contribute in other ways. And this character, that's what they do. And I'll tell you that getting a viable monk build is not easy, but that's two so far on this channel. So I hope you enjoyed the build, and until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.